If Roger introduced us to the idea of it, Whitebeard confirmed its real existence, then Vegapunk has now told us the significance of the One Piece. Chapter 1121 was hype all around. Now, I wouldn't say there were heaps of new developments in this chapter. You know, there weren't any major new reveals that we didn't already know, but it was still such a very, very solid chapter. One that particularly makes you, or at least makes me, feel so excited about this final saga of One Piece. And I guess if we're thinking about it, we could say that there was potentially a sort of reveal, a potentially new character, a new mystery man. But I'm sure we'll get to that later. Let's discuss chapter 1121. And we're going to start off with that very satisfying combo attack between Luffy and Bonnie against Saturn. Now, the first thing that I have to say about this attack is that I was quite surprised to see Bonnie reactivate her Nika form so quickly. You know, she hasn't actually been out of the battle for that long. I would have thought that it would take her a bit longer before she can muster up the strength to go back into that Nika form again. So it's all pretty impressive. It was also quite fun to see her in that quasi Nika form. Now it is still yet to be explained how she is using this form, whether this is going to be a part of her own devil fruit abilities or if it is because of Luffy's presence. So Saturn here repeats a similar claim that was made by Mars a few chapters ago, basically stating that Bonnie in that Nika form is just the clone, just parroting what Luffy looks like and that she doesn't actually understand the significance of Nika. And so if we put significance to these words said by the Gorosei, and I guess we should because the Gorosei as, you know, the heads of the world government just under Imu, they may, or maybe we could even say that they are even more likely to understand the real workings of Devil Fruits. Then this could maybe be taken to suggest that Bonnie really is just copying Luffy's Devil Fruit, that there is no deeper Nika lore at play here, such as Luffy as Nika being able to inspire others to unleash their wild imaginative forms. But if we actually delve into this deeper and if we think back to Saturn's words from chapter 1103. So in that chapter, Bonnie unsuccessfully attempts to activate a Nika form using her distorted future. And when she fails to unleash that Nika form, Saturn assumes that Although Bonnie knew the Nika name, she didn't actually understand the connection between Luffy's Nika form and her understanding of who Nika was as told by Kuma, her father. He thinks that she doesn't truly know who Nika is, that Luffy is the Nika of this generation. And he says that she doesn't really believe in Nika's existence and that's why she can't use that transformation. He explains that her devil fruit becomes more and more limited in terms of the different futures she can manifest because because her understanding and concept about reality narrows down, her beliefs become narrower, her understanding or her faith in what is possible or not becomes more and more limited. Whereas now, now that we can see that she actually can transform into Nika, this would then suggest, maybe even make it obvious, that Bonnie does indeed understand the significance of who Nika is and has the faith in Nika. And now you may be wondering why I'm going down this tangent here, but I have to say that I find it quite intriguing that multiple members of the Gorosei are repeating this line that Bonnie still doesn't understand the significance of Nika, that she's just copying Luffy, where in reality she has actually been able to take on his form. So based on Saturn's words from chapter 1103, this should suggest that Bonnie actually does really understand and recognize and believe in Nika. And why is this important? Well, I can't help but interpret that this is just the lie that the Gorosei they are almost telling themselves. You know, this is just copium for them. They're trying to soothe themselves and they're trying to convince themselves that Bonnie doesn't truly understand who Nika is. She can't possibly, because then what would be the ramifications? It's as if they're trying to believe their own lies that Bonnie doesn't actually believe or recognize Nika. Because then the alternative is to face the truth that as Luffy becomes more and more recognizable and the more and more people that believe leave in Luffy as Nika, he's going to inspire more and more people to believe in this legend, this so-called myth 
of Nika. And potentially, eventually, they will also be able to take on this limitless, wildly powerful form. And I'm thinking, maybe that is the true power of the Nika Devil Fruit. It's not just that Luffy can take on this wildly imaginative Gear 5th form, it's about inspiring others to unleash their full potential, their full imagination about who they can be. Which is obviously very fitting for Luffy, who I'm sure would be thrilled to know that he's inspiring others to be at their most free. And there's two ways that I'm thinking about this. On one hand, maybe it actually won't affect everyone. Maybe it's only limited to those who have imagination-based devil fruit powers like Bonnie. But because we know that Bonnie was fed the extracts of the Toshi Toshi no Mi from Saturn, it's not hard to imagine that he might have actually experimented with other babies. And if we question why the Toshi Toshi no Mi in particular, the Toshi Toshi no Mi, like the Nika Devil Fruit, being something, you know, to do with in the realm of imagination-based powers, it's almost as if Saturn wanted to create another Nika Devil Fruit user. As if he's been experimenting with Devil Fruits that are similar to Luffy's and that potentially this is something he's been doing ever since Who's Who failed to acquire the Nika Devil Fruit all those years ago. Which would then mean that there is a whole host of people out there who are the subjects of experimentation by the world government who all have imagination-based devil fruit powers and therefore would be able to unleash their Nika-related forms once they believe in Luffy or once they believe in Nika. Or if we go back even earlier in this arc to Vegapunk's theories about what devil fruits are, you might remember that Vegapunk speculated that devil fruits are all the manifestations of people's imaginations about potential futures of humanity. And in that sense, they're all imagination-based. In which case, maybe all Devil Fruit users can unleash a Nika form so long as they believe in Nika, so long as they have faith in Nika. And this might actually explain why Saturn was so hell-bent on stopping Kuma and Bonnie from leaving Egghead Island. Now, this is something that I actually pointed out in my discussion of chapter 1120. I thought it was odd that Saturn was going after these two specifically instead of attacking Emmeth along with the other Gorosei, instead of trying to stop Luffy, whom I thought at the time would be the larger, more important target. Whereas now, after this chapter, I'm actually wondering whether he was stopping Kuma and Bonnie because he recognizes the real danger if people like these two get out. If people who are true believers in Nika, people who would then further spread the good news of Nika, this would be a more dangerous position for the world government to be in because they would inspire more and more people to believe in this legendary sun god. You know, if Luffy is the only one that survives, if he's using his gear fifth form, people might look and go, wow, what a crazy power, what a weird ability, what a wild form. But it would be very rare for people to actually put two and two together and go, Hang on, that sun god Nika. And in that case, people might admire Luffy, they might be emboldened by him, but without actually understanding the true significance of Nika, they wouldn't actually be able to also unleash their own Nika forms. Whereas, if you have people like Kuma and Bonnie going out and telling other people there is a legendary sun god Nika who exists, he's here to liberate you all, you all should believe in him, the more and more that Luffy... Nika would gain followers, you know, much like a religion, and that's what the world government wants to prevent. So I know that was a deep dive into a very simple dialogue from Saturn there, but it is a crazy train of ideas I've had, and I don't know, call me crazy, but I think it makes sense. Anyways, that's just me spitballing, but let's go back to chapter 1121. So I think in this fight, we also see Luffy's great intuition on display. We see here that he fully recognizes Bonnie's desire to be the one to punch Saturn. And I obviously love that's also part of her willpower that helped her retake and reactivate that Nika form so quickly. But I also love that Luffy fully recognized this and he wanted to include her in the attack. He knows that Saturn should be reserved for Bonnie. You know, he's more than happy to help her out in giving that big old meanie a beating. But he knows that this is a giant spider that's tormented Bonnie and her father for all her life, and therefore, Saturn is Bonnie's to destroy. Now, speaking of spiders, the great irony surrounding Saturn is that 
he keeps calling humans insects in chapter 1121 as well. But then his creature form is literally that of an insect. Okay, maybe I shouldn't say literally because he is technically and scientifically speaking, spiders are arachnids. But still, he fits that description of, you know, a bug, an insect. And so it's even more ironic, especially after chapter 1121, where he does basically, you know, get squashed like a bug. But tangents aside, this combo attack, we've got to talk about it. Like I said, Luffy is more than happy to help out. You know, we could probably argue that it is actually Luffy doing the majority of the damage here. It's his Gatling attack that's really blowing the crap out of Saturn. Bonnie's liberating Nika punch is so heartfelt and meaningful. From a physical standpoint, it's becoming more and more likely that she does actually have armament haki. This was heavily implied in chapter 1119 when Luffy commented, it's because you guys are punching me with haki and Bonnie was included as part of that attack. And now in this chapter, we see her fist shaded, colored black again. So it's as if she is coating her punch with armament haki. So I would like to think that she does actually deal some damage to Saturn as well. But obviously more so than physical, Bonnie's role in this attack is the emotionally heavily laden, meaningful aspect. Someone has to keep count of how many times I've cried, how many times I've teared up during this Egghead Island arc. Because this panel of the happy family, the what if, the what could have been if not for Saturn, that was just way too much for me to handle. And I'm just so glad that we got to see this, that Bonnie experiences this in one way or another. And so because of that emotional montage, it is so very satisfying to see Saturn get blown off into pieces, blasted off the Elbafian ship. Now, I don't think that's the death of Saturn. We've seen Venus Juro come back with just half of his head blown off as well. So I'm sure we could expect the same of Saturn. But I do think, and I really, really hope that it will be a while before we see him get back up, at least until the end of the Egghead Island arc. We've had many of these similar moments. You know, those moments where I felt like, this is what you get for hurting Kuma, or this is what you get for hurting Bonnie type of moments. We saw it when Kuma comes to save Bonnie and then punches Saturn in chapter 1104. We saw it again with Luffy in chapter 1107. And so I wasn't really expecting to see this moment again in the Egghead Island arc, but I guess Saturn was asking for it this time, going out of his way to go after Kuma and Bonnie again. And also this way, we did get to hit that perfect trifecta, Bonnie also getting her moment, getting her moment of triumph and revenge. So I'm happy that Bonnie got her moment of payback. But that being said, I hope that Saturn is out of action for the rest of Egghead. Especially with all the bravado of this attack, we even got to see Kuma smile in response. I think this is a nice time to wrap up Saturn for this arc. In fact, I think this would be a nice time to wrap up all of the Gorosei. I hope that no one will be coming up to the Straw Hats and the Allies now. Both ships are en route, they're leaving Egghead, and I hope that that can be the end of it. I think the only thing that needs resolving now is Emeth. I've seen some complaints online about the Egghead Island arc, especially sort of this last segment of the escape out of Egghead. I've seen people complaining that it's dragged on too long. Now, personally, I don't quite feel that way. I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this arc immensely so. But I think we are at a nice time to leave the island now. I think if Saturn or if the Gorosei keep coming after the Straw Hats, I think it would just become a little bit too repetitive at this point. If we could just have the Iron Giant, the Emeth scenario wrapped up and resolved, that would be a perfect note to close down and wind up the Egghead Island arc. Now, if you listen to my discussion on chapter 1120, you will know that I am expecting Emeth to use Uranus, and I believe that that is going to be the crazy resolution to the Egghead incident that's on the headlines the next day. We got basically zero follow-up from chapter 1120 when Emmett said he's got a trick up his sleeve, he's gonna use it. Now's the right time, now's the perfect time to use it. Like I said, I think it's an ancient weapon and it would be perfect if we could just close that up now 
leave Egghead Island and move on to the next arc. And on that note, if you've enjoyed our discussions thus far, then please do subscribe because I noticed after my last video that 50%, almost 50% of you are not subscribed. And that saddens me. Deeply, deeply saddens me. And it'd be a really great boost for my motivation if we could get those numbers up. But with that being said, let's move on to the next part of chapter 1121. Actually, before we move on, still as part of that fighting scenario, something that I want to mention is Kizaru's dot 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 reaction. Now, this could just be a part of my copium, but a part of me is still hoping that Kizaru will take some definitive action, that somehow he will take a firm stance to actually help Bonnie and Kuma. His continued dot 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 reaction shots throughout this arc clearly depicts him as being conflicted with what's going on. So it'd be really interesting for not just his character development, but also for the rest of the world government and the story developments if he actually does something and takes action against the world government. You know, that could even be something huge that would actually resolve also the Egghead incident, something that could make the headlines if it's not the Emmeth using the ancient weapon thing that I mentioned earlier. But even if he doesn't take action, I do hope that we get some sort of deeper explanation as to why he's so loyal to the world government then. Like I said, it's quite clear that he is conflicted. I just don't quite buy that he is simply a lapdog of the world government without having deeper reasons why. And I don't think it would be great for his character if we didn't get that sort of justification. You know, I feel like at this point, we do need some sort of reasoning as to what makes him so hesitant in standing up for his friends, whom he clearly cares for. But I guess we'll have to wait and see. Anyways, let's move on to Vegapunk's message in chapter 1121. I have said this before, but I will say it again, and I really, really, really mean it this time. I do think that this is now, finally, the end of his broadcast message. And what a hype note to end his broadcast on. Like legends that have come before him, Vegapunk has breathed new life, has reinvigorated the world of piracy. If Roger introduced us to the idea of it, Whitebeard confirmed its real existence, then Vegapunk has now told us the significance of the One Piece. This is just such a hype moment, and if we had any questions, any doubts before, we have really catapulted Vegapunk into the Hall of Fame when it comes to his influence in the story. But there's actually quite a lot to unpack in Vegapunk's message for this chapter, so let's go through it all. So the first thing he says in chapter 1121 as his broadcast continues is to say that everything will be uncovered when the One Piece is discovered, which I guess is something that, you know, we've all known. It's been long confirmed that what Roger and his crew found at Laugh Tale included the secrets of the world. So like I said, not quite new. Vegapunk then also repeats that the ancient weapons still do exist, which is also something that he has already previously said during his broadcast, which then for me leads me to believe that Oda is just emphasizing the ancient weapons here again, the relevance of ancient weapons, because he plans on showing us the ancient weapons soon. And ding 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 ding, what did I say about Emeth and Uranus? So insert my prediction about Emeth activating Uranus before the end of the arc. But if we move on to the next part of Vegapunk's message, Vegapunk makes some intriguing commentary about the persecution of the different non-human races in the One Piece world. Now I have to say he's quite vague about it, but he seems to be saying, you may have noticed that those of unique races in the world have been persecuted throughout history, and that persecution has been for some unknown reason. But that reason will soon become all clear once we find the One Piece, because all the secrets of the world will be revealed at that point. So basically meaning that the existence of the different races in One Piece, their relationships with the Ancient Kingdom and the Twenty Kingdom, and the Twenty Kingdoms, sorry, that they're all intricately related and are critical to what happened during the Void Century. And again, I don't think this is huge news, and I mean that in the sense it is something that we have been able to somewhat put together ourselves before this has been spelt out to us in Vegapunk's message. For example, 
King as the last of the Lunarians. King shown reacting to this part of Vegapunk's message. And we've already known from the Wano arc that the Lunarians were persecuted by the world government because the Lunarians were dispossessed of their lands on top of the red line because the world government or the celestial dragons wanted that land. Which now also makes sense when we know that the world is sinking. So it's fair to assume that they wanted high land for themselves. Even in this Egghead Island arc alone, it's been suggested that there is something unique about the Buccaneer race that's also resulted in their subjugation throughout history. And Kuma reacting and responding or wondering about his lineage is also part of the montage of the different racial ancestries in this chapter. So again, while this information about the different races isn't huge or new information necessarily, it obviously is very significant and it raises more questions about what exactly is that link? You know, what exactly is is the history between all the different races, how does it link to the central lore of One Piece? Especially because even some of the antagonists themselves have experienced prejudice in their history. We see in this chapter the reactions of King or Arbear as the Lunarian, or we see Pudding, former antagonists of previous arcs who are examples of those who have faced prejudice. But if we move on to the rest of Vegapunk's message, the next part is his warning to be on guard and to survive until that day of reckoning comes. And then next is that his hope is that science and knowledge and wisdom will win. I have to say that the different cutaways to the different locations and the different characters reacting during this sequence, or if not reacting, at least shown during this montage, that was really well used in my opinion. For example, the shot between Caesar Clown and Judge right next to Weatheria. It's a perfect visual embodiment of Vegapunk's next part of the message. That it all comes down to who holds the power. Just as he warns that ultimately, the fate of the world will come down to who finds the One Piece, we also see that what happens to the world comes down to the different types of scientists, to the different types of people that exist in the world. On one hand, we have scientists who use their knowledge for evil, like Clown, like Judge, like the Neomads. On the other hand, we have scientists like those on Weatheria. And so it's such a clear visual representation that the fate of the world comes down to the type of people who have the knowledge and who have the power in the world. Which is also a very sobering reminder about Vegapunk's role in all of this. If we remember to very early on in his broadcast, Vegapunk apologizes for the role that he's played in the use of the Mother Flame. And this isn't the only time that Oda uses this sort of cutaway or this sort of composition, this idea of two sides of the same coin, because we get it soon again when Vegapunk says that there is no guarantee that the One Piece will be found by the person or the persons that Joy Boy wants it to be found, wants it to be found by. Because we get a cutaway to Hachinosu, you know, Blackbeard's base, right next to Shanks' Red Force. Again, really emphasizing this idea of good and evil about two types of people in the world. If we continue down this analysis of cutaways, I have to say it was very funny to see some of the Navy soldiers want to go after the One Piece for themselves, but I guess in some way that's also another reminder that not all Marines are alike, not all Marines are good. We have some who genuinely want to protect the small folk, protect ordinary citizens, and then we have others who want to seek their own glory and fame. And then we also have Buggy's legend and the faith of his crew in Buggy continuing, and that's very hilarious. Uh, but of course, the most hype part about chapter 1121, the most hype part of Vegapunk's message, that glorious final double page spread. The end game is here. The race for the One Piece is well and truly on. And what a freaking setup. So many legendary characters, so many intriguing, meaningful relationships that we have to, have to address. It was suggested to me during my reaction stream that if we split this double spread in half, that it's supposed to be a setup of the rivalries or the opposing matchups that we're going to get in the future. So for example, we could see Sakazuki versus Sabo so that Sabo can avenge his brother Ace. Dragon could avenge his own father when it comes to fighting Kuzan. Whereas Kobe versus Imu could represent the good and the evil when it comes to the Marine slash the world government. And now I won't really say anything about Figurland Garlings matchup because that would be too speculative for now, although something could be said about that Shanks's sword look-alike. And don't worry, we will get to speculate.
manipulating that mystery man soon. But more so than 1v1 matchups, I'm really just taking this final double page of the chapter in because I think it's just a great visual reminder of all the complex interrelated relationships that we have, all of which that have to be resolved in the story. Because as important as the rivalry between Shanks versus Blackbeard is that of Luffy and Blackbeard, we also have the very unique frenemy relationship between Shanks and Buggy. They're all just so richly intertwined. You know, Sakazuki might be Sabo's target, but he also might be Kobe's when we think about the very differing ideologies that both these characters have when it comes to justice. Not to mention Dragon's potential history that might link up with Sakazuki, might relate to Imu. Who knows who Dragon might be entangled with because he's a man that's still so shrouded in mystery. I've long been a proponent of an all-out, massive, free-for-all, just a crazy battle royale where everyone's in the ring, everyone's fighting one another, all sorts of different factions, infighting within factions, between factions. I personally think that would be amazing, so entertaining to witness. And even if that's not the way it goes and we do resolve some of these relationships and some of these battles one by one, I just can't wait to see how it all unfolds. And if we are really finishing up the Egghead Island arc in the next couple of chapters or so, as I anticipate Anticipate and hope that we do so, then this is really the best way to get us hyped, really hyped up for our next step into the final saga. And of course, the best way to introduce us to this mystery character. Why is he holding a sword that is similar to Shanks? And I have so many ideas about that one panel alone, so we are going to save that discussion for another day which means make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss out on that discussion. Thank you to all of you who have stuck it out this far for listening to one of my crazy ramblings. If you're one of these legends whose name is scrolling down the screen, then thank you for becoming a patron or channel member. If you'd like to join this rank of legends, then please do consider becoming a patron or channel member, but feel no pressure to do so, but do feel pressure to come back and watch the next video because I do really Really appreciate your continued viewership so immensely and on that note see you again in a future video this is joy girl and i'll see you again soon